Claudia from the Global Coalition on Women and AIDS. For those of you who don't know us, we have these lovely brochures here that will tell you a little bit about us. They're all along on that table there. But essentially, what the Global Coalition is, is that we are a network that brings together civil society partners working for women's rights and gender equality in the context of HIV with the United Nations. So it's really about facilitating that dialogue between the UN and women's rights advocates. What we wanted to do today is have you meet some of our advisory group members. So we have an advisory group of 14 members representing different constituencies of women. So we have Rebecca Matheson representing Straight Errors and ICW. Then Baby Ravona from the Asian Indonesian Network of People Living with HIV. And Lydia Mungarera from the Mamas Club who sits on one of our sexual and reproductive health seats. So since they're here, we wanted to open it up to really have a discussion about violence against women, what the Global Coalition on Women and AIDS is doing about it, what we should be doing, and then really open it up to hear from you what you think we need to be doing more of collectively to really make violence against women a global priority for everyone working on HIV. So with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to get us started. Thank you, Claudia. Hi, everybody. Um, as Claudia introduced me, my name's Rebecca, and I'm representing ICW. Some of you might not know what ICW is. It's the International Community of Women Living with HIV. Um, we're a global network that advocates um, for women's rights, women living with HIV. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, discrimination and violence that I've faced and women in Asia and the Pacific have faced and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think we can mobilise communities to end that discrimination and violence against women living with HIV and women from key populations. So um, I've been living with HIV for 20 years and um, in that 20 years every year I've been stigmatised and discriminated against in one way or another and violence has been enacted against me because of my HIV status. Um, in healthcare settings, I've been asked regularly and ongoing how I got HIV. Um, healthcare workers prejudge me and stigmatise me, and I also internalise that stigma. I don't understand why healthcare workers would want to know why, how I got HIV, and. Um, I've been forced into having a cesarean section for birthing my children. I've been forced to bottle feed my children. I've been denied services because of my HIV status. My children by default have been denied services because of my HIV status. Women in our region have been sterilised. They've been forced to have abortions. They've been criminalised and they've been discriminated and stigmatised. Um, as I said, for 20 years I have been discriminated and stigmatised and I think that um, because of that stigma and discrimination, it's a real um, barrier for women living with HIV to step up and mobilise. We can't do this alone. We can't end violence and discrimination against women uh, living with HIV on our own. And uh, the importance of mobilising uh, local communities, local governments, uh, national networks, allies, supporters, uh, global policy makers in our plight to end uh, discrimination and violence against women living with HIV um, will only happen if we have support at the grassroots. Um, you know, our advisory group and the people around us and our core team work at a very high policy level, but we also take our work back to the grassroots and if meaningful change is going to happen for women living with HIV, it has to start in our local communities. And I really hope that we can have an interactive dialogue around how that might look because that mobilising includes the people that are sitting here listening to us talk. And um, without allies and supporters, we won't end violence and uh, we won't end discrimination against women living with HIV. I'm conscious of time, I'll let my colleagues talk a bit, but we hope to be very interactive and have a dialogue around uh, discrimination and violence against women. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you also, Claudia, to give the space for the one of survivor of the violence in Indonesia. 
I'm the one of the survivors of the violence against women living with HIV. So uh, if I'm working on this field now, because uh, I, I can see that a lot of women living with HIV in Indonesia is not so brave enough like me to out from this, the circle of the violence. Yeah? For example, there's a lot of uh, coerced sterilization uh, the last three years. And then also a uh, few months ago, my son almost kicked out from the school because I am uh, show up in the television in national level. And also, uh, uh, lately we have uh, about uh, almost 40% uh, from 100 women living with HIV in Indonesia have multiple uh, violence from the partner. So I don't know, I'm living with HIV for 13 years now and we are still struggling with these issues. Yeah? And in, in, in Indonesia also, violence is a, a separate issue and HIV is a separate issue. So what we can do as a, as a woman living with HIV to address this, because uh, I have a patient to help my colleague who are not brave enough like me to show up, to say that I'm a, a victim of a violence, who are afraid to disclose the status, who are afraid uh, about uh, the children, the family and everything because uh, they open up, they got the violence from the healthcare setting, from the partner, from the family members, even from the community. Uh, so we address this issue through the program to integrate the violence against women living with uh, the violence and HIV. But this is just a new program in uh, Indonesia, but all, almost in Asia Pacific, this is a pilot pilot project in Asia Pacific also. How to make a stakeholder have better understanding that uh, violence uh, should integrate with the HIV program. And also how a woman living with HIV uh, should have a better knowledge. There's, uh, because you are HIV positive, it doesn't mean you don't have any right anymore. That's what we try to do with this program. So this program is just starting for six months, and I wish from this pilot we can adapt in Asia Pacific as well. And we will see, yeah, maybe the next conference I can present the challenges and then the achievement of this uh, program and then the evidence base as well. So yeah, I, yeah. just uh, give your question if you want thing. Uh, one more about the Indonesian, about the Asia Pacific and everything. Yes, thank you. I forget my name, baby Rifona. <laughs> you just call me baby. Yeah, even I'm old enough, I'm still baby. I, I use this one. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Lydia Mungerera from Uganda, and I, I, I'm with the Mamas Club. I founded it in 2004. I, I have. In my region, Africa, violence against women is an everyday part of life of most women. It's in our backyard. But I just want to concentrate in my work, my work environment on the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights for young mothers, because I'm working with HIV-positive mothers, and I want to look at the young ones. We have adolescent mothers, and mothers as young as 11, 12 years, 10 years old. This is now a child having a child. If you can see a mother, a 10 year old, 12, 11 year. The most important issue now where violence comes in there is that most of these young girls, of course, you know very well, they run away from home and, and, and they're not accepted by the family. So they end up in somewhere in the lost in, out there. And when they get lost out there, they're now taken up by, 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 by men who find them where they are. And these men t get hold of these girls and they, these young adolescent girls. And because she's already had a baby, she's already HIV positive, but the man, these men are just taking advantage and they get hold of this girl and they actually make her a sex slave. And we have, the problem is that she doesn't have family support anymore. She doesn't have peer support from her friends anymore because she's HIV positive. She can't go to a health center. Now what happens at the health center? Of course, you know very well that a young girl is scared to go to a health center. An adolescent mother appearing in a health center is being asked by the health worker, what on earth happened to you? Just those words are so scary and stigmatizing. So in that way, these young girls turn to other things. I mean, there are so many, and, and, and it, safe abortion is not allowed in our country. So there's, they go to undergo illegal abortion. 
they, 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 they find other places to go to to have these babies, so they cannot get access to elimination of mother-child transmission. And, and of course, you know very well what happens when, 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 a, when a, a, ch a mother like that gives birth to a child. She doesn't even have a partner. Most of them, these girls, of course, these men are just passing through. They're not really partners. They've used this girl and dumped her. So she's HIV positive, she appears there. Now, she doesn't have a support system. So what we are doing as Mama's Club, we are forming family support groups. And these family support groups, we are bringing in the adolescent mothers to sit separately on their own. And we are trying to look out for them from their homes. And we are referring them and linking them to the health center. And then we are forming young peer support groups. To, and, 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 and within that, we're able to empower these girls, give them skills. Of course, as we know, many of them have dropped out of school. And so getting them into some kind of formal training where they can go back to school. But the most, one of the things I want to talk about, the areas of violence. Number one, of course, stigma and discrimination. This is a young adolescent girl, you can imagine. Number two, uh, the whole thing of just the area of having HIV AIDS when you are young and when you are out there. Number three, you're discriminated by your peers. Number four, the school itself. You jump, many of them are chased, some are chased out of school. The school system doesn't allow them to go back to school, so they're out of school. And then, of course, the other thing is that taking up, you're now, these girls feel now worthless. So any man can come and violate them. Now, most of our young mothers are living up in the northern part of our country where there's a long conflict. Some of you know about that the abducted girls who were taken from school and were taken and made sex slaves by this rebel fighter. So they're post-conflict girls. Getting the trauma, the trauma itself of, you are now a sex wife of some soldier. They've got you out of the bush. They brought you back into civilization, as I can say, and you have nowhere to turn to. So I saw, so this, these are the, 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 the real cruel realities that are happening with, with young mothers. The other issue, of course, is that we have areas where recently, where they're still carrying out female genital mutilation, FGM. There are districts where you find young girls have run away from homes because their parents are trying to force them into early marriages, and they're telling them they want to marry them off because that's how they say that, you know, we have circumcise you, you're supposed to, it's a culture, and send you off to a certain man to get married. And they've run away because they want education, they want to take where to go. And I think just FGM itself, female gender mutilation is violence against women. That itself is there. Of course, the other issues are gender, social, cultural, masculine norms make women vulnerable in Africa. Because you're not supposed to answer back. You're supposed to be, uh, to accept all the cultural things. Polygamy is still there. There's widow inheritance still going on. It's surprising at this day and age, there's still widow inheritance. Then, of course, a woman is not supposed to be educated. A woman is supposed to sit back and do cooking. And of course, you know very well that a, a disempowered woman can easily have her rights violated. And so you have no right to say no to marital rape. You have a woman just stays, lives in that battered life for all her time until, until, until she finds a support group or she's able to get access to legal services. Of course, even legal services are expensive. So. And then, of course, we know very well that, of course, vulnerable groups exist. We have the commercial sex workers. They're always being rounded up and taken to the police station. And who violates them when they get there? The policemen themselves are the ones having sex with them and raping them in, 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 in prison. We have those. We have also that once they call uh, LGBTI, you know, in Uganda, the law was passed. So we know very well that they have this, you know, lesbian, gay, transgender. There's a lot of violation there too. Of course, they're not even allowed to come. I mean, there's this, this whole, whole thing that you are scared to, people are scared to come out, they're hiding somewhere. And I think this is, this, some of these discriminatory laws are, are what is actually precipitating this pandemic because we don't even know who's, how can we treat them? How can we look after them? Then of course, you all know the recent criminalization law, which, is, was, uh, which, is being, which, is being, which has been passed by parliament. We've now currently locked up a 64-year-old nurse. They've locked her up in prison for three years. We have been trying to advocate for her. We tried our level best not to get her sentenced. And they wanted to give her a murder charge because she pricked herself accidentally. She covered her, her finger with a bandage and she's supposed to have passed infection onto a child who's actually HIV negative. So they put her in prison. So Namubiru 
is one of the examples of what criminalization does for women. And of course, if you talk about criminalization, men are actually blaming women for spreading the infection. And of course, you know who's going to be thrown in jail. We've had so many circumstances where women have been beaten up, cut up into pieces, because they're supposed to have passed the infection, because men don't come to health centers for testing. And so it's the women who come. When she gets, when she gets uh, tested positive, she goes home, and the man is saying, why have you ashamed us? Why have you disclosed our status? So gender-based violence is a driver, a major driver of our pandemic in Africa. We are living with it. And of course, the younger you are, the younger the girls are, the more vulnerable they are because they can't speak out and they're not empowered. I think the, the incredibly sad but real thing in hearing from the three of you is that it shows that violence against women is really something that spans a woman's entire life cycle. Since you're a small girl and as Lydia said, you know, you're raped for the first time, you're forced to undergo uh, female genital mutilation, you're married off as a child bride, to then when you become pregnant and, and there's all of this discrimination, you're forced to undergo a cesarean which isn't needed, forced to bottle feed your child, and just then forcibly sterilized, beaten every day. I mean, we all know the realities are incredibly stark, even more so for women living with HIV. I want to pick up, though, before I pass it around for, for thoughts from you, on Lydia's, one of Lydia's last points, she's saying, you know, a woman is battered in all of these spaces until, until she finds a support group until she has access to justice, until she has access to legal support. So it's not that there isn't any hope here. You know, it's a very, very stark picture, but there are things that the Global Coalition is doing, that the MAMA's group is doing, that ICW Global and the Indonesian uh, Network of Women Living with HIV are doing, and I'm sure things that we can also learn from what you're doing. So with that, I want to open it up to, to the participants here to hear a little bit about what you're doing and also what your recommendations are to really scale up work and confronting violence against women living with HIV. I just wanted to say that um, in terms of healthcare providers, when they provide discrimination, I really agreed with you that they ask questions or they're not trained well, and I think there needs to be an education and training, especially for healthcare workers, because we would think, we would assume that they are qualified and have the sensitivity. And I think when you mentioned that point, when there's discrimination at that level, it's not only in our homes, but it's also in the public sphere. So thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. And I think one of the things that the Global Coalition and its partners are looking, um, that are currently working on and have been working on is addressing that and looking at how we can create programs at um, a country level uh, that are around uh, training and education and information sharing um, to ensure that healthcare workers have the um, information, um, have a sensitivity to women living with HIV, but also women from key populations. Um, it, it, you know, it's not all doom and gloom and we do paint a stark picture, but I think it's also important to talk about the work that we are doing, but um, how important it is that we need to take that work and expand on that work, and without um, collaborators and partners and allies, uh, we can't do that. Yeah, I'm so agree with you because yesterday we have a session for sexual reproductive health and right, and then we have a workshop with all the participants. And then this come, uh, this suggestion is come out where uh, you should train the health uh, provider in terms of human right, so we can eliminate the corset sterilization. And also, uh, this is not we're talking not about violation only, but the violation come out because we promote the sexual reproductive health and right. So since we promote the sexual reproductive health and right, we have a fun finding that the violence is there. A lot of violence is there. So I can say that a lot of women not aware or not lack uh, a knowledge of sexual reproductive health and right. This is the violence issue come out because of this issue. So. 
we try to uh, increase awareness among women and also government and also other stakeholders. But in Asia Pacific region, especially like in Indonesia, you talk about that sexuality is a very taboo and it's very hard to push, yeah, uh, regard the sexual uh, reproductive health. So they want to turn uh, the wording or whatever, but we have uh, evidence in country level. But remember, we don't have evidence in Asia Pacific. Yeah, this all happened in Asia Pacific countries. So we need evidence for Asia Pacific. Do this uh, sexual reproductive health is very important, and then uh, how to address the violence for the women living with HIV, especially. Yeah. Um, one of the things that that's, that we wanted to do, actually, as health workers, because I'm a health worker too, is that we wanted to go through the the health professional councils, uh, medical association, the associations that the nurses. Medical Association, is a uh, doctor's medical association. We have got the pharmacist. And we are thinking that they have these annual get-togethers when they meet and they have what they call the continuing medical education. So we thought that, you know, if we could come up with a project, a, a proposal where we have people living with H health workers living with HIV coming to talk to them a little bit about HIV because in that time, many of them trained long ago and there was not even HIV at that time. Some of them is just because of fear and, and I don't think it's lack of knowledge, but, but you know very well that there's a lot of stigma and denial within the health work setting itself amongst our colleagues. They fear, they, they fear that, and, and some of them just are just in denial. And there's a time we prepared something called Caring for Carers, and Caring for Carers was actually looking at how do we get health workers to talk about issues like HIV, talk about issues like gender-based violence, talk about, and, we, and especially that, that, that the nurses and midwives have got a very strong association, and I think that they, they can do that. But the thing is that, what is there in the healthcare setting to, 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 to manage a, per, a person who has gone through gender-based violence? In our healthcare settings, there's nothing to really take a person and say, if you've been had gender-based violence, where do you go next? So I think a multiple strategy should be used to integrate and have a way in which you can refer a, a woman or a young girl to somewhere where the girl can get help. So, so, so working with the legal fraternity, working with, um, with lawyers and maybe law enforcement, if, they, if you know. But there's, well, we need to train our law enforcement officers. Even our legal people need to be trained on the issues of really gender-based violence and stigma and discrimination for HIV-positive mothers, uh, women and, and, and girls, yeah. Are there any more comments, questions from the audience? Okay, I'll, I'll, let me just add to that point then, because we, oh, we talk a lot about the need to train healthcare professionals, legal professionals, um, and I think it's important to say that part of that training needs to be actually dialogue um, and working alongside women living with HIV, because it's very different to you know, study something in theory and hear these are the principles of human rights. You know, All lawyers will have had that in law school, but it's a completely different thing to meet someone from the community who has the lived experience and who can also exemplify how sometimes when our healthcare workers, our legal workers are trying to do the right thing, they're actually saying things that are incredibly stigmatizing. So just again, to pass on that message about this training sh isn't about putting something on the books, but about actually bridging that gap between communities and healthcare legal professionals. And also don't forget for young women, yeah? Young women, uh, this, uh, for them it's uh, very hard to get access. Yeah, for, for the sexual reproductive health access, especially like for example in Indonesia, uh, if you uh, uh, consider as a youth, yeah, you cannot go for access for the uh, uh, like a pap smear or everything because you are underage and then, but you are sexual active. Yeah, we have a law there in Indonesia. How can you prevent to get the condom for your sexuality active? So we must advocate this issue, yeah, for the young woman, uh, and also for the for the youth, yeah. This this is a right, yeah, to have a, a, a sexual activity, and then the important is 
sexual education. You give the sexual education to the young people, and then they know when they first start to have sex, and then when they start uh, to have a baby, when uh, with state of Asia they can get married, or I want to have a baby, or I don't want to have a baby. So this is this is still struggling in this issue for the sexual education. Yeah. How about you, Rebecca? <laughs> Yeah, I think I just would like to add to that and um, really reinforce that, um, you know, without collaboration, without partnering, without um, broadening our reach from our HIV networks, we won't um, create change in policy. We won't create change in, um, you know, social value. We won't create change around people's understanding of HIV. And I think, you know... Interestingly, there's been a lot of dialogue over the last few days in this zone about how we strengthen our partnerships and how we strengthen collaborative um, programs uh, to reach out to our, um, not, not the usual suspects, I suppose, but really looking at how we can partner with um, women's health organisations, with sexual and reproductive health organisations, with educational institutions, um, with government. You know, really, it's at all levels of the response. And, uh, you know, I can speak from an Australian perspective that certainly um, women have not been included or consulted in um, our policy frameworks. You know, our national framework was just um, uh, launched and uh, there's no mention of women in that. Um, so, yet again, you know, I have been um, stigmatised and discriminated against by my own government. So, it's really important that we, we leverage... Um, the, the political um, support of the Global Coalition and our partners to ensure that women do have a voice at um, that uh, most highest level. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kwagala Betty. I'm a medical counsellor working with Tasso and I've been working as Dr. Lydia for so many years. But um, I'm going to talk um, uh, issues concerning women with disabilities. This is a forgotten group of people. First of all, women with disabilities are stigmatized, are discriminated. They don't get sexual uh, education. If you go for services, they look at you as if you are not sexually active. There's a lot of negative attitudes. I work in the hospital when we encourage like um, women with disabilities come for services. Even clients themselves, they forget what I've taken them there and they start talking about a woman with disability. Look at her. She's in a wheelchair. How can she get HIV? And because of that, they end up not even seeking for services. So um, my humble request that whenever you're having movements of women, Think about women with disabilities. They are completely forgotten. We are trying, okay, some of us at this level, we are trying. But there are so many other women there who cannot even talk for themselves. Even if you talk the right thing, they look at you. What are you talking about? Where have you, um, how did you get HIV? Okay? Who pregnanted you? For example, when I was pregnant, I was asked so many questions. I'm married. Yes, I'm disabled, but I'm married. I was pregnant like any other woman. But when I went to the hospital, this nurse asked me, who pregnanted you in the presence of my husband? Then she asked my husband, is this your sister? I'm like, no, she's my wife. And since then, in fact, I hated that hospital and I delivered from somewhere else. So there are so many things surrounding women with disabilities. I thank the effort of uh, Dr. Lydia. She tries her level best to bring mothers with disabilities into Mama's Club. We need other people also to put more effort to bring these women with disabilities on board. Thank you. Thank you, and, and one of the things that's very clear is that, that, that many of these, they're also used you find women who are living with disabilities and, and, and these men just go there and they start, they think, you know, because she's disabled, she can't move, we can use her. And we've seen many rape cases, actually, with women living with disabilities. And they have uh, HIV positive. 
there are things that they're not taken as, as they're, used, they're taken as sub objects to be just used. Because says, after all, who is she? She's disabled. So that's one of the things that, that's very critical. And I, and I think we really need to look at it's, it's one of the vulnerable groups which who I really I have passion for. Yeah, I, I mean, I also, um, at different times in my life, have um, identified as a woman living with a disability, particularly when I had an AIDS-defining illness. So I think there are some com many, many commonalities between the movement for women living with HIV and the movement for women who are living with a disability. And I think that we can certainly learn a lot from each other um, as we grow and we move forward in this epidemic. And um, uh, certainly, you know, from an ICW perspective, we would really like to see um, greater dialogue and communication between the, um, the two global movements. Yeah, uh, this is a good idea for us as an adversary member of Global Coalition Women on AIDS, yeah, to give input for the Global Coalition Women on AIDS to bring disability women, yeah, to, as a, our member, advisory member, so we can uh, more comprehensive the movement, the global movement, to the, address this issue. Thank you for your input, yeah. Thank you. I've forgotten one thing. Um, I need also to appreciate international community of women living with HIV and the Pan-African uh, Positive Women's Collision. These two women organizations realize that gap, that there is a need for representation of women with disabilities. In the um, in international community of women living with HIV, I'm their treasurer for East Africa. And they went further even to support me to come for this conference. They supported me to come and um, present my paper because I've just started a new network in Uganda. It was established this year in April. It is called Positive Women with Disabilities Network of Uganda. So this is a new, new program. But they have facilitated me to come and represent that network. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think we've been a, a small but very important session, and I think we're definitely going to take forward your point around uh, women with disabilities and just continue to broaden this dialogue. I'm going to end by pointing out that we have just been joined by one of the great supporters of the Global Coalition on Women in AIDS, Sheila Talou. <laughs> Sheila does not go unnoticed ever. She is the director of UNAIDS uh, regional office in East and Southern Africa and a wonderful advocate to stop violence against women. Welcome, Sheila. Thank <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>